Okay, I'm, I'm gonna put away my ice brand short sword and take out my flame tongue short sword. Wait, why? The the ice brand does well, more damage. Because puffle wolves are immune to cold damage. And how do you know that? I just made an arcana check and came up with nothing. Come on, it's common knowledge. Everyone has heard of puffle wolves. Wait, wait, is that the monster manual you've been reading? What? No, what are you, what are you talking about? And that looks like the module we're running. No, just just my personal journal. That that that's metagaming! Let's let's get him! I cast fireball. Welcome to the DM Layer. I'm Luke Hart, and I've been a dungeon master since the first time the Detroit Lions won the Super Bowl. On this channel, I give practical dungeon master advice that you can implement at your game table. Recently, I made a video about cheating in D&D and how a dungeon master should handle it. One of the examples of cheating I gave was players looking up monster stat blocks, and you would not believe how many responses in the comments I got from folks saying they didn't feel that was cheating. So I said to myself, I guess it's about time to make a video about metagaming. First, we'll talk about what metagaming is, then we'll touch on if it's good or bad for the game, and finally, we'll discuss what a dungeon master can do about it if, in fact, anything needs to be done. Quick disclaimer, too, by the way. When I searched for this topic on YouTube, I noticed that lots of other folks have done videos on metagaming, lots of people that I deeply respect, by the way. However, I resisted the urge to watch their videos. I wanted to address this topic cold, so to speak, based upon my view on this topic as it currently stands. It's also likely that there are elements to this topic that I haven't considered. In that case, I encourage you to let me know down in the comments. I read almost every single comment I get and respond to all that I can. Who knows, I might even need to make a metagaming part two video. Anyway, we need to define metagaming to have an intelligent conversation about it. But in order to define metagaming, we really need to define role-playing first. Now, according to this book, D&D is the world's greatest role-playing game. Now, whether or not you agree with it being the world's greatest is a topic for another day. My point simply is that D&D at its heart is a role-playing game. Role-playing is when you assume the role of someone else, that is, pretend to be that person, and you make decisions and take actions as that person based on that person's motivations and knowledge. In D&D, we pretend to be clerics and rogues and barbarians and wizards, and then we do things in the game based on what those characters would do in a given situation. We all know that barbarians smash things with their axes, rogues stab things, clerics heal the wounded, and wizards, well, wizards cast fireball, right? Always without fail. Metagaming, on the other hand, is when a player uses real-life knowledge to determine the in-game character's actions. That is, instead of only using the information my barbarian has available to him to act in the game, I use the information that Luke, the player, has available to me. For instance, if I make a perception check to find a secret door and roll a three, and then turn to someone else and ask them to check for secret doors too, just in case, I'd argue that's metagaming. See, my character doesn't know I rolled a three. My character did their best to find a secret door and didn't. At that point, asking someone else to check is probably metagaming. And how do I know that? How do I know my character wasn't just playing it safe in character? Well, I guarantee you that if I had rolled a 19, I darn well wouldn't be asking another player to double check. See, I'd be fairly confident that there was no secret door so I wouldn't bother. Now, sometimes failure is obvious. You're trying to be sneaky and roll a three on your stealth check. In that case, you probably know that you scuffed your foot on some gravel and made a lot of noise. So that sort of thing definitely depends case by case. Looking up monster stat blocks in the Monster Manual or Volo's Guide to Monsters or Morning Canyon's Tome of Foes is another example of metagaming. Why? Well, you need to ask yourself, does your character have access to all of the important information about every monster in the world? Does your character know that stuff? I guarantee you, they don't. But Luke, you may say, my character lives in the game world. They've learned many of those things through experience or study or from hearing stories from others. And you'd be partially correct in so much that your character may 
know many of those things about the monsters. May being the key word, and it's up to the game system and the dungeon master to determine how much you actually know. This is when the humble knowledge check comes into play. Dear Mr. Dungeon Master, I'd like to see what my character knows about this creature. Ah uh, yeah, give me an arcana check. Or religion check, or a history check, or a nature check, it'll depend on the creature, of course. But you see, at that point, you and your dungeon master would be determining what your character actually knows about the creature. And then, once that's determined, you'd be free to roleplay your character with that knowledge without falling into metagaming. I think probably one of the most obvious examples of metagaming I can remember in one of my games happened a few years ago. One of my players cast a sleep spell into an area that he couldn't see to target creatures that he couldn't see, but placed the spell at just the right spot to affect all of the creatures. You see, the player could see the minis on the board, but his character didn't know where they were. So the player was metagaming by having his character use knowledge that he didn't actually have. I could go on all day giving you dozens of examples of metagaming and all of its various permutations, but I feel like we should at least have a solid understanding of what it is by now, right? So let's talk about whether it's good or bad or neither. But first, I want to let you know about dndadventuresforkids.com. It's a site I found out about that offers 100% free D&D adventures designed for kids. As you may know, the players of my youngling campaign are all kids. Well, probably technically teens now, so I really dig that these guys are offering free D&D adventures for kids. And if you're looking for other D&D adventures just for like normal adults and stuff like that, I have several available for download on my site, thedmlayer.com as well. There are links to both of these sites down in the description. Okay. So, is metagaming good or bad? Well, if the premise of D&D is that it's a role-playing game, and metagaming is when you use information not available to the character that you're role-playing, one could argue that you're not playing the game the way it was intended to be played. One might go so far as to contend that metagaming is cheating. And I'm sure there are some extremely brave souls out there who would argue that metagaming is the antithesis or however you pronounce that word, of role-playing and world-ending apocalyptic scenarios could result from its repeated use. I'm sure they would argue that metagaming is the opposite of what the game was intended to be. It's supposed to be a role-playing game, but instead the players are not playing the role to true fidelity. The argument would go something like this. If you're going to role-play, Roleplay. If you want to play a video game and look up online all the information about the final boss so you can beat him, then play a video game. But Luke, you may say, there are some dungeon masters that are okay with their players metagaming and looking up monster information and whatnot. And I would respond that there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, here's the thing. I'm not going to tell anyone how they should have fun. If your dungeon master is cool with everyone metagaming and that's just what your group does, then rock on. However, doing so would be deviating from role-playing as we know it it goes against the very nature of what role-playing is. But one thing I've learned is that everyone is playing a different game, so to speak. And if your group is metagaming its little butt off and your DM is cool with it and everyone's having a blast, then please, for the love of all that is holy, ignore me. However, all of that said, I do feel there are certain parts of metagaming that are acceptable, shoot, even beneficial for the game. Let me explain. Imagine if your player's characters approached every single encounter with uncertainty about whether they stood a chance or not. That is, their PCs were not sure if the group of humans were super powerful and shouldn't be trifled with, or if they were within their pay grade, so to speak. You see, this sort of metagaming isn't all that bad. You know, where the players know that it's a game and that most adventures were designed for their PC's level and abilities, and thus have their PCs approach the encounters with a certain confidence that they can take on the foes. Can you imagine how frustrating the game might become for dungeon masters whose players fled in terror from every encounter because they were just role-playing their characters? Or players who had their PCs retire at level one because it's a big, dangerous world out there and who knows if death is right around the corner or not. This sort of metagaming rather makes the game possible, I feel. And let's look at another type of metagaming I see a lot and totally support. Have you ever had PCs in a party that under any other circumstance would not travel together? You know, the paladin and the rogue that just don't see eye to eye? Well, if the players were really role-playing properly, 
they'd probably not adventure together. However, there is a social contract of sorts at work where the players know they are supposed to be an adventuring party and stay together. So they have their character go along with it even if they ordinarily wouldn't. Absent that sort of metagaming, it'd be really hard to play D&D, I feel. And what stops your players from banding together with other adventurers and increasing their party to 10, 15, or 20, or taking on hirelings to help them out? In a real world with real dangers, that sure seems safer than just the four of them having a go at it alone. Again, we are saved by the social contract and a little bit of metagaming. I think the common element that these types of acceptable metagaming have in common is that they promote a respect of certain game premises without which the game would be significantly more difficult to manage or perhaps even fall apart altogether. What can the DM do about it? So let's say that your players are involved in the bad sort of metagaming. What can you and what should you do? I'll tell you right now that if I got worked up over every instance of metagaming that I see at my tables, I'd be a madman foaming at the mouth and popping blood pressure pills with every breath. In other words, I see lots of metagaming, but I pick my battles. Not every instance is worth getting worked up about or even worth addressing. I let a lot of the minor things go. Now, some of you are gonna get upset with me about this and are all like, Luke, Luke, what's wrong with you? You need to take a stand for the purity, the, the sanctity of role playing. To which I say, calm down. It's a game. You see what I said right there? It's a game, a game. And what's the purpose of a game? to have fun. And believe me, there's nothing fun about repeated, frequent accusations of and conversations about metagaming. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't ever have them. There are instances of metagaming I feel are grave enough to be addressed. And when they happen, they need to be addressed. Looking up monster stat blocks with the intention of using that knowledge in game is certainly one of them. As is a player reading the module their dungeon master is running. These forms of metagaming and others that you may deem severe enough definitely need to be handled. Let's talk first about how not to address metagaming. The good old tried and true method of punishing the player's character. You take 4d10 psychic damage for metagaming. Like seriously, can we all just stop punishing players' characters already? Do we really think that will do anything besides upset the player? So. How do I address metagaming? First of all, it's always a conversation with the player, and I usually do it at the moment, at the game table, in front of the other players. I will basically ask the player how their character has access to whatever information they are metagaming with. Now, sometimes they'll give a reasonable response and the issue is settled. Other times, they don't. And in that case, I tell them I feel it's metagaming and that they shouldn't act in character on that information. However, what I don't do is not allow a player to do a thing or force them to do a thing. You see, I personally make it a point not to steal player's agency, except under a very narrow set of circumstances. So I'll have that conversation and I'll call them out on metagaming but I leave the final decision up to them. Now, I feel like I'm blessed with amazing players, so usually that's all that's necessary. Let me know down below where you fall on this whole metagaming issue. Next week, I'll be telling you a story about the power of the words yes, but, and until then, click right here to watch a video about dealing with cheaters that sparked the idea for this video. And until next time, let's play D&D. &D.